Got it. All right. So, not necessarily parasites in the news, but Cotless, Sunday or Monday? Uh, highly pathogenic in avian influenza here in, in the United States. Caught it. Um, really, the initial articles didn't say much. It just said avian influenza uh, in the flocks. Uh, so I had to kind of check out some, some other aspects of it. Uh, it's in wild birds. So just this month, like, Literally last week, yeah, flocks, chicken, turkey, and, and chicken flocks that tested positive for highly pathogenic influenza, avian influenza. Uh, and they, you go in and call that herd. You call the entire flock. Uh, and this isn't, they didn't just like do random sampling. My guess is, is that farmers started seeing rapid death, and they went, called in the vets, sampled it, came up as influenza, and then they took out the herd. Uh, they had this H5 strain in the U.S. in 2015, 2016, and then it just kind of disappeared. So this isn't the first time. Actually, 2015, 2016 was the first time it made it over to the United States, uh, and now they're, they're seeing the reemergence here. So these are all of the uh, strains and stuff. So where they, where they were pulling them from, the New Hampshire, these are wild birds. You're picking up these. EA is a Eurasian strain H5, which is forms in a clade uh, that was found in geese in China. If, if I remember it right, they had hundreds of geese were just dead on the side of a lake, uh, washed up on the shore, and it was this highly pathogenic virus. Um, it's not, I mean, it's in birds. Birds have different type of linkage in their lungs that these viruses recognize, but we have had transmission. You, we have had human cases, close contact cases, and when you get this clo close contact case with the H5, it's more, dead, more deadly than COVID. Let's put it just simple. So yeah, it's popped up in the news. I'm interested following it, seeing, seeing what's going on. Um, I don't know if any of you know like chicken farms around here, but it's bad, you know, the push for backyard poultry, there's a, there's a downside for downside of that. The first case that was found was in the West Coast, and it was a reassortant virus. So it had the, Eura the, the uh, Eurasian H5 genes, but uh, had North American low path strains. So, yeah, avian influenza isn't, isn't surprising in the wild birds, but detecting this H5 here, the highly pathogenic H5, that is rather interesting. So that popped up. That popped up. And so far, as it, this, is, this, when I said the news, I just said highly pathogenic avian influenza and clicked on the news tab. These are more than what was appearing. When I, when I, when I saw it for a second time, I said, I need to look it up. And really, no news, news articles. No, no, none of the news uh, organizations were reporting it. So if they're calling the herds, uh, we might see spikes in chicken and egg prices. So watch out for that. So parasites, viruses, and the news. All right, this is where we left off. Uh, so exam next week, Friday. Um, I'm already working on it. The lab practical will be that, that following Monday. Uh, you will have uh, kind of, you will have some multiple answer questions, um, and then you'll have multiple choice questions. So the idea right now is to have more multiple choice and multiple answer. I don't know how many we'll have. Uh, could be maybe 30 questions of those total, so maybe like 20 and 10, 20 for multiple choice. And then multiple answer questions would be things like, uh, you know, if, if I asked, uh, like, which of these are symptoms of schistosoma, schistosoma mansoni, 
right? And I'll have individual symptoms, and then you, you mark which ones are, are associated with it. Um, so there's a multiple, multiple answer, multiple choice questions. Uh, part three is disease names. So knowing like the regular disease names and what parasite causes that. Uh, make sure you study those. Uh, then we'll have our diagnoses, which is I give you a scenario. You, you tell me the parasite that causes the symptoms that I present. And uh, I have one symptom or two symptoms that are bolded, that are in bold on that sheet, and you tell me why they're, they're in bold or what causes that. So if we talk about you know, blood in the urine for, let's say, I don't know, uh, hematobium, schistosoma hematobium, right? And that's, that's what we're looking for. I'm looking for, you know, the eggs entering the bladder or being moved into the bladder, right? A granuloma moving eggs into the bladder or something like that. And then our last, last part is life cycles. We had our life cycle quiz. Um, you should get those back on Friday. Same type of format, you'll have a pair, you'll pick one, and you'll diagram the life cycle. So life cycles are 10 points each. Um, the diagnosis is two points, one point for the parasite, one point for the symptoms, uh, or for the cause of the symptom. And then, basic, uh, then the disease names is, I think, one point, and then our, uh, I'm not sure, I think normally our multiple choice are two points, just kind of depends on how many I have if I'm, if I'm going to make those two or one. Probably one based on the other content that we have on the exam. Questions? Is this the last part for you? No, I handed out the other one. We've got tapeworm diversity. All right, so we left off here. Excretory os osmoregulatory system. Uh, you'll see it on, especially tenia, I believe. You'll see these uh, lateral or these uh, ventral collecting ducts. Go over here. Nervous system. Um, again, we're in the platyhelminthes, so it's going to be similar. Uh, for our cestodes, we do have uh, cerebral ganglia. Those are located in the scolex. And they have two nerve cords extending down the length of the strobula. So they extend down the length. And I mean, no big surprise, you need sensory ability in those proglottids. So you're going to have some sort of nervous system. Uh, the one exception is diphilobothrium. It only has a single ganglia. Uh, so that's, that's kind of weird. But point is, it's going to follow basically what we have with the platyhelminth. We had talked about those transverse commissures in the platyhelminthes. Is usually we see those. That's that ladder ladder type system, the orthogonal type system. Uh, these are going to be present, and they're present in each proglottid. Are we going to be able to see them? No, not in any of our specimens. You'd have to use different staining techniques to try to emphasize those. Just kind of giving you an overview of these. All right, ready? All right, reproductive system, highly variable. It's highly variable in its structure, arrangement, distribution. This is all among the various taxonomic groups of the cestodes. Hopefully you, you were starting to see that as you were looking at our slides that are in the lab. All right, so I'm not gonna have specifics yet. We'll just point out characteristics when we get to the diversity, you know, key features of the Male and female systems, their arrangement, you know, the ordering of stuff is basically similar as the rest of the platyhelminthes. So you'll you'll see, you know, your serous, your seer sac, uh, seminal vesicles, vitellaria, they all have the same function in the tapeworms as they have throughout all of the other uh, platyhelminthes. Now we do want to point out that protandry occurs in most of our species. And protandry is where we have our male organs develop before the female organs. All right. So 
just in, in generic, when we talk about organisms that, that switch sexes, yeah, protandry is when you have the male and then they'll transition to female as well. In our tapeworms, the male reproductive organs mature first and then the female organs. And we've already kind of talked about that. We talked about that as the, the maturity of our proglottids as we go down that, that strobe. So this is just protandry, also called androgyny. Protandry, just know that if we look at early stage, young strobola part, you know, male is going to develop first. Uh, and we said at that time, and this might actually be an adaptation to avoid self-fertilization within a single proglottid. So, you know, it, if you have males that's fully developed, the female system is not, you can't fertilize that. So you have to wait and get to those more mature proglottids where the female systems develop, but now those male systems are, are degenerating and, and no longer develop. So that may be the evolutionary significance. All right. Not bad. Life cycles. <laughs> We're going to break down the life cycle into two general life cycles. Right. One of them would be an aquatic form life cycle for, this, for the tapeworms, and then the other would be a, a more terrestrial type of life cycle. And we're going to do that because our life cycles have a lot of diversity. They have a lot of diversity in them. So we can kind of break it down. This isn't universal, but we're going to break it down to try to ease, or ease the introduction into the, these life cycles. All right, so in our aquatic cycle, so th this kind of gives you all of the variation, starting with the A, like what happens, and all the various uh, life cycle stages. And again, now we're introducing even more life cycle terms, or larval terms of the various larval stages. So if we start with the aquatic stage, you know, so those tapeworms that are completing their hosts in aquatic organisms, the A gets released, uh, and then oftentimes, is releasing a coracidium. Now I put the coracidium in parentheses because it just kind of depends on how we're going to develop. Right? In life cycles where we need an active type of life cycle stage to get to that next host, then it's going to be a coracidium. And the coracidium will define it when we see it. All right? But it's a ciliated stage. That's what it is. So it's going to move it around. Uh, and then once they that coracidium, it's a ciliated stage, but the cilia, it's basically an outer egg membrane, and again, we'll go over it. The egg membrane, outer egg membrane, or the inner egg membrane is ciliated, and that's surrounding the oncosphere. So this, is, this coracidium is almost like a ciliated oncosphere. All right, but the oncosphere is uh, a hooked stage, has, has hooks on it to a penetration. They get into tissue of the host, where they then develop into a procercoid. They get to a next host where they develop into another stage called the plerocercoid, and then that plerocercoid gets the, to the definitive host where they mature into the adult. So we'll see, this is, if I ask for a generic or a general life cycle of an aquatic tapeworm, or a, a tapeworm that utilizes uh, aquatic hosts, this is what we're looking for. So you can see Procircoid, pleurocircoid, and then the adult. And the key thing for these is that we don't have asexual reproduction in these. So one egg would ultimately give rise to one adult. In the terrestrial stage, we're going to be a little bit different. Now, many of our terrestrial life cycles, we, we utilize stages, intermediate larval stages that can reproduce. So our, generically, we have the egg, egg hatches, Releasing the oncosphere. Nope, we don't have a coracidium. We're not in water. No benefit for a ciliated stage of that. We've got the oncosphere that penetrates into the host, and then it develops into a cystocircoid or a cystocircus type of larval stage. And we kind of call these bladder worms generally, all right, because they tend to have some sort of ball or bladder. That was kind of like the cystocircus, cyst let's see here. This is a circoid larvae that we have in the lab in the slides. All of that's basically the bladder. Only the real dark spot is that's our scolex. Right? And these oftentimes 
reproduce asexually, giving rise to even more of them in the larval, in the host, intermediate host. And then when the definitive host comes along, uh, it will uh, consume these, get the larval stage, and the larval stages develop into the adult. Key thing about cestodes is that we rely on trophic interactions, trophic connections. So all the infections, they're happening through the food chain. Right? Things are getting, the larval stages are being eaten. And that's different than our diagenetic trematodes, right? Schistosoma, the cercaria penetrated into a host. Right, we have Miracidia that penetrated into the snails. The cestodes, no. We need trophic connections. All right, so I do note that there is variation in our basic patterns. So I'm just giving you kind of a general pattern. There's variation to this. Uh, but probably the most important type Met are these metacestodes. Metacestodes would just be a generic term for the larval stage of our, of our cestode. And we will, we will produce um, some specifics. We'll have some specific life cycles. All right, so that one common lar larval stage in both the aquatic and terrestrial is an oncosphere larva. The oncosphere larva is also called a hexacanth larva. So named because it has six hooks. Let's say three pairs of hooks. You've got hook one, hook two, hook three, hook four, hook five, and hook six. Those hooks are likely used in penetration because the oncosphere is going to burrow into the tissue. This oncosphere is non-ciliated. And it ultimately gives rise to our next stage. This develops inside the egg, and the egg has several different layers. So sometimes you have coat, you know, almost like a slime protective coat. And then you have your outer egg envelope forming a shell inner egg envelope that could also be part of the shell that both of these kind of confer uh, protection. And then you have your embryo four with the oncosphere developing inside of it. In our, some of our aquatic stages, aquatic life cycles, what happens is the inner envelope is actually ciliated. So you don't need as much protection against dehydration and desiccation because you're in an aquatic environment. So this inner envelope has now been modified into a ciliated type of coat. That ciliated stage allows the oncosphere to be mobile. That is what our coracidium is. A coracidium is that ciliated oncosphere where the cili ciliated part is the inner envelope. So coracidium is oncosphere that has retained a ciliated inner envelope. Ready? The metacestode is where we see a lot of different variation depending on our life, type, life cycle. So we separate them between a solid type larval stage and what's called a bladder type of, of life cycle stage. A solid type of larval stage uh, are procircoids, pleurocircoids, cystocircoids, and pleurocircus. More solid type. Bladder types, cystocircus, you know, cystoids versus us, cystocircus, idatids, and strobilocircus. And you've got, I've got images here to kind of show you all of these. All right? So, you can see a bladder associated with it, or hydatid, it's one big bladder with the scolices that develop inside of it. Right, versus our solid type of worms, where it really is one, one individual gives rise to another individual. So most of our bladder type will exhibit some sort of asexual reproduction, and the asexual reproduction that we see is budding. Right, you've got a germinative layer that ultimately starts to differentiate and produce another individual, and then more and more and more and more. Strobilocircus doesn't do that, but it's kind of an exception. But 
This is Oncosphere, could give rise to any of these, and it's gonna be basically uh, taxonomic specific. So wherever, whatever group we're talking about, those groups have specific types of larval stages. All right. All right, let's go through our diversity. I'll leave that up as I'm opening up the next one. All right, we ready for this? All right, are you sesto diversity? This is a big one. So we're gonna break it down into orders. Really just two main orders that we're gonna talk about. Tetraphylidians, um, those are um, So the tetraphylidians, that's where we have the, uh, it's where we have our um, acanthobothrium. So it's our bothridia scolex type. Uh, we're not really going to talk about those. So the first order we're going to talk about is orosudophylidia. Typical scolex of this type is both, bothria, uh, bothria. So the sucking groove type of scolex. So normally they have two of those sucking grooves. They're going to run longitudinally along that scolex. Members of this order have three genital pores. Three genital pores. So you've got the male, female, and the uterine pore. They could be median or lateral. In, in our species, it's median. Vitellaria are always follicular, and they're scattered around the periphery of our proglottid. So the follicular part would be kind of what we see in our digenetic trematodes. So you've got small, small circles, you can say, uh, that form an entire set. And then you've got individual duct coming from each, leading to one common vitellin duct. That go, leads to the oatype. So in this group, we have vitellarian follicles, right? And they're located around the periphery, on the outside of that, that uh, proglottid. The interior part of that proglottid is where we would find the testes. Right? And the testes are going to be numerous. We're not going to see, you know, two testes side by side like we do in. in Digenea, they're, they're all, again, they look follicular, and they're just going to be completely scattered. Hard, hard, hard to separate. They're going to be hard to separate the vitellaria and the testes unless I tell you where they are. They're on the outer part or the inner part of our proglottid. The life cycle, typical life cycle of the pseudophilidians, uh, more of an aquatic life cycle. So our first intermediate host will be a crustacean. Our second intermediate host will be a fish. That's their typical life cycle. It's important to note that this order actually contains the largest of our tapeworms. Hexagonopterus physeteris is more than 30 meters long. How many meters do you think this room is? length of this room. What do you think? Six. Six meters? probably have another three. Let's, let's say 10 meters. This is like the room is 10 meters. Our largest tapeworm, there and back. And one more. 
more time. That's massive, man. Up to 45,000 proglottids. Each proglottid is going to have four to 14 complete sets of genitalia. Why? Why is this? Well, it infects sperm, wear, sperm whales. <laughs> how, what's the population size of sperm whale, and how likely is it that our parasites can find their way back to a sperm whale? Probably pretty darn low. Now, this guy is basically adapted to just pumping out eggs. Pump out eggs just for the chance of getting back into another sperm whale. So, adaptation, increased reproductive output. So this has a pretty good, pretty good diagram uh, of a pseudophilidian. Kind of pretty good diagram to represent our specimen in the lab. So our bilobed ovaries, uterus is midline, three genital pores, or three genital pores uh, up locator uh, in that area. So uterine pores often slightly to the side, but you've got your uh, vagina and the uterus sac opening all at the same time. So would you expect, like, <clears throat> every sperm whale to have one of these parasites in the wild? Not necessarily, no. If it is, it means our transmission is really good. Probably don't need it to be as big. I don't know what, what the prevalence is in the sperm whale. But I'm just thinking, 30 meters long, that, that's massive. Right? Massive. A long piece of fettuccine. Just, just think of that. All right? All right, first family we'll talk about, Caryophyllidia. The reason we're going to do this, this is monozoic. That's the reason why we're introducing this. Uh, members of this family are usually found in the intestine of freshwater teleosts, so freshwater bony fishes. Uh, primarily, you're going to find them in the cyprinids, so your minnows, minnow species, your catfishes, and capstomids, which are the suckers. They have a simple Bothria scolex, which you have up here. So these are kind of sucking grooves. They're monozoic, so only one genitalium. And we don't have our segmentation in the, stro in the strobola. But the internal anatomy really does resemble the pseudophilidium. So you've got your three genital pores, you have your scattered follicular vitellaria in your testes, you have your uh, three genital, did I say three genital pores? Three genital pores, bilobed ovaries and, and all that stuff. All right, so the example that we'll give is Caryophyllaeus laticeps. It's called a clover worm because of the shape of the skull. Kind of almost resembles like clover shaped. Now it's not like your three leaf clover, but kind of that, that edge. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the life cycle. As part of the life cycle, we have a procircoid. So this is one, one of these life cycle stages that we'll talk about. Procircoid is a metacestode. What distinguishes it from some other larval stages is that it possesses a circlometer. This is uh, the Caryophyllaeus laticeps circumere, or procircoid. The circumere is this part down here. So this circumere is a posterior knob-like appendage uh, on a procircoid or a cystocircoid that has its lateral ho or larval hooks. So the larval hooks are remnants from the onchosphere. They've retained them. So where you can think of these hooks being on the anterior portion of the onchosphere to aid in penetration, these have now been relocated to a structure called the circomere. And they've been retained. And this is how we know this is our procircoid stage. All right. Let's leave that up. Let us, oops, sorry. On the wrong part. Let us get to our life cycle. There we go. 
use the short one. All right, let's mute it. definitive host. Our adults are going to be found in the intestine. All right, so eggs are going to be released in the feces. Eggs are going to be uh, released in the feces. It's considered an apolysis. I'm going to put that in quotation marks. And clarify that it's no proglottids. Because these terms, an apolysis and apolysis, always kind of referred to how the eggs get out when we're dealing with like a polyzoic cesto. But we are in the cesto, so those terms should still apply. This is anapolysis. Our egg's going to be ejected from the worm, all right? And then the eggs are gonna travel with the feces out of the host. All right, these eggs are gonna remain infected for at least three months. For at least three months. And that's significant because Three months is about the life, maximum lifespan of our next host. The ligachetes. Tube effects of ligachetes. Tube fissids of ligachetes. So these eggs. They're, they're infected for about three months and thus can infect the next cohort of worms. So, I'm going to kind of jump ahead, is that our fish are going to consume these. So, when they get consumed, then your eggs are going to start being produced, um, and that allows them then to get to that next generation. So you're not infecting the current ones where they might be near the end of their, their life. So we have this, adapt, you know, you can say an adaptation to uh, survive for at least three months where they can infect the next cold one. Now, they're gonna be consumed by these oligochetes. You're gonna have an oncosphere in the gut egg hatches, releases the oncosphere in the gut. The oncosphere burrows out into the hemocele where it develops into a procircoid. And so we're now in, in the hemocele. And then you can have it all just kind of depends on if this fish is eaten, when, or where are we in this lifespan. If a fish doesn't eat it right away, you're gonna, your procircoid will become nearly mature. And that's important to know, a nearly mature procircoid. We'll come back to that idea. So we need to at least get to our pro-circoid stage to infect our fish. And they get, they get infected uh, by consuming these worms. I guess I'm just I got these. All right, so they get into the fish, it's also being in the intestine. It's noteworthy that the egg Egg production 
is stimulated by reproductive hormones. Stimulated by reprodu reproductive hormones. So, when the fish starts spawning in the spring, that triggers egg production. And then these things will start producing eggs. All right? And that'll last for about two months, at which point our worm will die. So these eggs then get released about the time or shortly after the spawn happens. The eggs are out in the, the environment. They can persist for up to three months where they go into these tubificid oligochetes. All right? The, these oligochetes, I said three months, they live about one year. Turnover happens in June and July. June and July. So your spawning is, let's say, March and April. That triggers egg production. If the eggs get into the environment and infect these guys in June, there's a good chance that that host is going to die and not get into another fish. But if it infects them, let's say, in August, we have a chance to get to the fish. Now, where did these guys come into play? Here's what's in interesting. All right? If you get to this stage and a fish consumes that stage, this will complete maturation in overwintering fish. If these guys aren't reproducing, there's no trigger to start egg production. So these things, the procircoid, they're not quite mature yet. They will start to become adults, but they don't fully mature. It'll, well, it'll take that entire winter period, October, November, December, January, February, to get to the stage where they're ready for egg production. But if our fish come out of winter, as they're preparing for the spawn, they're eating a lot, they're building up fat stores in preparation or uh, they're utilizing energy in preparation for reproduction. We get to this stage so that if we do get to the fish, we can have rapid egg production, especially if we infect early in the spring. So a lot of times in our life cycle, we get to a stage and we stop. And our development doesn't occur, our development doesn't continue until we get to that next host. Not so with this one. This one, its life cycle is such where it's kind of timing the life cycle, uh, its life cycle with that of the host. So it's going to continue developing in our tubifex, knowing that if it survives winter and gets eaten by a fish that comes out of the winter phase, it can now develop rapidly and start producing eggs right away. So August, September, October, parasite's gone. You're not, you, you don't see it in the fish. It's gone. Questions? Interesting last thing. All right, second family, Diphilobothrium, or Diphilobothriidae. Diphilobothriidea. Diphilobothriidea. Fortunately, a species of interest is Diphilobothrium. This is called the broad fish tapeworm. So named because proglottids are fairly wide. The broad and it infects fish, or you can find it in fish. It's not the, all right, you can find it in fish. 
There are 13 distinct species, and all 13 can infect humans. Diphilobothrium dendriticum is found throughout the northern hemisphere. Diphilobothrium latum is found in Scandinavian areas, Baltics, Western Russia. Uh, that's its native range, but it has also been introduced into areas around the Great Lakes and now on the West Coast. So we can get infected with either of these. No longer is it, oh, if you get diphilobothrum here in the United States, you must have dendriticum. No, latum is here now. About 9 million people are infected worldwide. All right. And we've got, I've got my stages up here. So you've got, we're going to have our core city. This is what a ciliated oncosphere looks like. And we're going to see our pro circle. There's our circle. Then we also have another stage called a pleurocircoid. So our pleurocircoid is a metacestoid that's going to develop from our pro circle. But we don't have any larval hooks. The circumere's gone, hooks have been either dropped or reabsorbed. And these guys normally have a developed scolex, the scolex that they will have as an adult worm. So this would be kind of, as you would imagine, a pleurocircoid to look like in muscle tissue of a fish. Questions? I guess we will continue. We have five minutes. All right, we're going to do a life cycle of that little doctor. And what we'll probably have to do is, I'll probably have to draw this again on. on Friday. Right, so Diphilobothrum dendriticum or Diphilobothrum latum. Artifinifos is a fish eating mammal. which includes humans. The adult is found in the small intestine and actually is found only in the anterior third of the small intestine. We do have some site fidelity. These guys have three general pores. And eggs are going to be released via anaphylysis and releasing the eggs into the environment. Now, we need the eggs to get into the water. Once we get into the water, our eggs are going to hatch, but they don't hatch immediately. The hatching is light-dependent. So it needs to see both 300 and 600 nanometer wavelengths. And it's probably tied to ensuring that it is in a proper location. So once it hatches, we will have a coracidium. That coracidium is very short-lived. Only lives about 12 hours. So it needs to find our first intermediate host to help it along its way. These guys are negatively geotactic. 
What does that mean? Negatively geotactic. What does that mean? We respond to minerals. Good guess. Good guess. Not quite. Not quite. It's a good guess. What else? Why? Why? Yep. They don't like touching the earth. <laughs> they don't like touching the earth. They're actually, yes, they are swimming away from the earth, away from gravity, basically. So they're swimming up to the surface because their first intermediate host are copepods. And copepods feed up near the top of the water column. They're feeding on algae and stuff. All right, so now we have our coracidium gets consumed. All right, and in the gut then, that ciliated part will drop releasing our oncosphere, that's in the gut, and then this will burrow out into the hemocele, where we will now develop into our procercoid. So our procercoid in the hemocele. We have to get to the procercoid stage in order to be infective to our second intermediate host. So these guys are just hanging out, letting the copepod do its thing. Copepod gets consumed by a fish. Where we now have our procercoid in the gut. The procercoid will penetrate out of the gut and get into various tissues where it will develop into the pleurocercoid. So various tissues in our fish. Once we get to our pleural circoid stage, now we are infective. So we can be consumed by a fish-eating mammal. Now, this migration is a source of pathology for the fish. It may actually be beneficial to the parasite if the parasite can transition to a chlorocircoid fast enough. Because if you cause some pathology and cause that fish to slow down, it's going to be more likely to be eaten by a fish-eating mammal. But, in many cases, these fish that are consuming our copepods are not going to be the target for our fish-eating mammals. Sometimes they can be. They're small mammals. But a lot of times they're not. So if another fish, if a larger fish comes and eats these smaller fish species, then our pleural circoid will just migrate to various tissues of that fish. And stay there until it gets eaten. And happen another time or two. Just kind of depends on where when we get to our stage. Pretty cool adaptations. We haven't even talked about all the adaptations yet. These would probably be considered a peritonic even though it's a fish species, our second intermediate host is the one, is they gonna be that first stage because that host is feeding on our copepod. And then if it's a larger fish species, they're just bridging our gap to get to, let's say the human or a bear or some other larger mammal that's gonna consume fish. Why do they consume fish? It's food. How do they get the parasite? By eating uncooked fish. All right, so we will pick this up. I'm going to probably have to draw us on the board again. Um, actually, maybe not. 
We might just pick up, and ha I might ha just have you open up this life cycle, and then we'll talk about some of the adaptations. So there's a couple other adaptations in this life cycle that, that help it. All right. All right. Uh, I did release the quiz for the Sesto introduction. You've got until the end of the day on Friday.